Hey, greetings everybody, it's Gleekon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode we had a doozy, quite a long chapter. We've been hitting those lately where we're just going along, trudging along, then all of a sudden the authors will just throw a mega chapter at us. Like, it's just, if you look at, what are we at? Yeah, we, I mean, I don't know. I can't, I, I didn't check before, so I don't know what how much of a percentage we jumped in terms of the book read, but... Um, it was a long one for it's it's definitely the longest Christy Golden chapter we've read in any of her novels um, and probably close maybe the second longest it would have been the longest chapter we've ever read if it wasn't for that blood of the high elves chapter two that scarred me um, it luckily both of these are good so at least there's that we haven't been hit with like a crazy long chapter of some book that was also just boring or terrible all right, so on that chapter, um, the parents died. We knew it was going to happen, and now she's sort of going to have to become the leader of the Rangers. Um, and she's also like going to not be able to, to admit to everyone that this was the horde that did it. So stay a while to listen. Stay a while. And you should do chapter 10 um, as we see probably her becoming Ranger General. That has, I mean, that's the next step. We also just have a couple more chapters really to to the next big phase of her life so this has to be probably a kind of a long one too where the second war unfolds sylvanas woke in her own bed for a moment she drifted in that half asleep half awake stage feeling something nudging at the back of her mind memory descended like a hammer strike she flinched trying to curl herself into a ball to shut out the world but sternly she forbade herself she owed it to her parents, especially to Larissa, to be stronger than ever. Sylvanas Windrunner refused to go down in history as a weak ranger general. Someone had laid out her clothes. Servants? She could not see how Nathanos would allow anyone near her right now. It had to have been him. Besides, he would be the only one who would know what armor she would need today. She arrived at Farshida Retreat with her head high, and if her face was still pale, it revealed no trace of vulnerability. Nathanos did not accompany her, and he was not as he was not a far strider. Sylvana took some comfort in seeing Verissa, also clad in her armor. Sorrow somehow made her features even more beautiful. Sylvanas wondered what her own grief had done to hers, but she did not care. This was a part of them now. There had been a recall of all the far striders possible on such short notice. Illyria still was not among them. So be it. As the highest ranking far strider other than Sylvanas herself, Lorthamar would be swearing her in. He gave her a reassuring smile. A few more stragglers entered, and then all were assembled who would be coming. Lorthmar stepped forward. There is always sorrow when naming a new ranger general, he said. It means that we have lost one, even as we stand poised to gain another. So before we continue, I would like to take a moment to speak of Larissa Windrunner. Many of you have served your whole lives under her. She was brave, clear-headed, stalwart, and bold. When we received the news, perhaps you, like me, simply could not believe such a fierce spirit was gone. There are many stories about her valor and skill, but there is one that exceeds all the others, because it tells us not only of Larissa's battle prowess, but also of how deeply she cared about the far striders she led. Who here was present at that battle's beginning? Four hands were raised. Savannah suddenly wished she had asked her mother to tell her own story, Larissa was too modest. Now she would only ever hear about it as a legend. Let us tell the story then. Vorathil, will you begin? Vorathil nodded. It will be an honor. The Imani had been quiet for some time. Then completely unexpectedly they launched an incursion. No simple raid, but a full, well-planned and executed attack. Not only were all their finest warriors in the vanguard, but so was a terrifying creature. The tortured thing had been an eagle once, but the trolls had cruelly warped it with their dark magic, twisting it into a true monster. He paused. Relian took up the tale. Larissa's unit, which had been out hunting in the area, was the only one close enough to respond. Four of us still live who were with her then. We numbered only seven, and we had lost a few of our arrows in the hunt. We stood our ground a league away from our mark, and many troll warriors fell. But these arrows we could not retrieve, and too soon our ammunition was low. We were prepared to use all we had, then fight hand to hand and die, protecting our people. But Larissa would not hear of it. 
Sylvanas knew the story by heart, but had never heard it recounted solely by veterans, nor in such heartfelt tones. Emotions rose in her, grief, admiration, love, and concern that she might not lead this group as well as her mother had. I don't want to let you down. Celissa, standing beside him, spoke next. Larissa had one arrow remaining. She asked each of us to give her one of ours. Then she gave the order to fall back and defend the village, and turned alone to face the enemy. We thought she was sacrificing herself to allow our escape, and we were devastated. But this was Larissa. I suppose we should not have doubted. Auric Sun Chaser cleared his throat. <clears throat> we barely had time to put up some defenses and prepare the villagers to fight for their lives when we saw the trolls approaching. Without the monstrous Dark Eagle they had created, and outpacing them was Larissa Windrunner. It is impossible to tell you how morale surged. I have never seen its like before or since. By the time the trolls arrived a few moments later, they were fought off by such vigor and passion that those who survived fled. Not a single elven life was lost. After our victory, Larissa's took us to the battlefield. There lay the dreadful dark eagle, enormous, hideous, dead. It had an arrow in each eye, one in its throat, and four tightly clustered in its heart. I could not help myself. I exclaimed, you have slain this monster on your own. He lifted his gaze and smiled at Sylvanas. No, Larissa said, and she pointed to the seven arrows, six of which we had given her, embedded in the monster's corpse. I succeeded because you lent me your strength. There was a respectful pause, then Lorthamar broke it. Larissa will never be replaced, but we are lucky that she will be succeeded by her daughter, continuing a very long line of Windrunner Ranger generals. He turned again to the assembled rangers who had formed a circle with Sylvanas and Lorthamar in the center. We honor tradition, but we are also free-willed. We serve our people, but we are not servants. As was done in millennia past, I will ask and you will answer, if you will follow Lady Sylvanas Windrunner, supporting and obeying her as you did her mother. Lorthamar nodded to Haldoran, and the young ranger replied with a resounding, Yes! The yeses followed around the circle quickly, automatically, until Helios did not respond. Lorthamar frowned. Helios, what is your answer? Helios looked at Sylvanas steadily as he replied, We speak of tradition, and that we have been led by a windrunner for centuries, but we have also traditionally pledged ourselves to the ranger general's eldest child. Which tradition is the true one? Many of us still believe that Illyria should be given the title. Sylvanas was stunned. She knew she was not universally beloved at court, but among the far striders she thought she had a second family. Helios was not citing tradition because he valued it. It was because he did not want her. Her fists clenched. Anger, bright and hot, flared in her belly, welcomed up to the bleak lethargy and pain of the previous day. She opened her mouth to defend herself, but another calmer voice than her own spoke first. I believe, said Lorthamar Theron, that would be a mistake. Haldoran stepped up beside Lorthamar. I agree, said Haldoran. I would gladly have followed Illyria Windrunner, and she wished to inherit the title, but she did not and made no secret of it. It was a source of friction that in the end splintered the Farstriders. Lady Sylvanas accepted the title, although it should never have been her responsibility, and she has not wavered. Which of you is unaware that within an hour of learning of her parents, Sylvanas was on her way to conduct an investigation into their death, said Lorthamar. We grieve the late Ranger General and Counselor deeply. How must she have felt? Yet she pushed aside her emotions and set herself to learning about the threat, as much as to protect us as to bring closure to her family. Illyria and those she left with have still not responded to the summons sent to her. Sylvanas was trembling, and tears threatened to fill her eyes. She had thought the family had kept the rift between Illyria and Larissa secret, but now she realized how impossible it would be to keep secrets from those trained to listen and observe. Friendship did not demand the statements Haldron and Lorthamar were making now in front of court, the public, and their fellow Farstriders. The two spoke for her because they believed what they said. They had watched her struggle and seen her determination and wanted to make sure others saw it too. As you say, Lady Illyria has not yet replied, Helios said unruffled. We should give her the chance to decline. It is her inheritance. 
which she already abdicated years ago, Orthamar reminded him. She might not have wished the title at the time, but now, no, everything is different now. We should delay until she can be reached. Orthamar frowned. I submit to you that in Lady Sylvanas we have the skill and temperament of her mother and the wisdom of her father. Illyria chose the wider world. It is an admirable decision, but it does reflect her loyalties. Sylvanas, he turned to look at her, chose us. I did choose the wider world, came a familiar voice, and Sylvanas did choose you. Sylvanas's heart seemed to stop for a moment. Murmurs rippled through the room as every head turned to see Illyria Windrunner, her armor stained, her face sweaty. Dark rings made her eyes seem hollow, but even so they blazed fiercely. And it was the right decision for the two of us, for the Far Striders, and for Quel'Thalas. She entered the retreat, striding boldly up to stand shoulder to shoulder with Sylvanas. Theresa said nothing, but it was impossible for her to hide her smile. I came as soon as I could, Illyria whispered for Sylvanas's ears alone. I should have been there for all of you. I'm sorry. All at once, the cold knot of anger and resentment in Sylvanas's chest dissolved. Grief and pain would take time to recede, and likely would never disappear altogether, but at least this wound of Illyria's absence would no longer torment her. You're here now, Sylvanas said, and tears blinked away an instant later filled Illyria's eyes. The eldest windrunner turned to address the gathered farstriders. I came here thinking to see the farstriders uniting behind the leader our mother chose for you. Instead, you squabble like children, using my absence as an excuse to nurse your private grievances. That is not who we are. Helios pressed his lips together in silent disapproval. Lyria did not miss it and said, You wish to delay the vote until I responded? Here I am, Helios, and I tell you with my whole heart that I am where I am supposed to be to best help our home, and so is my sister. I am so glad she is here protecting Quel'Thalas, just as I was glad many years ago when she protected me and saved my life. Sylvanas could not believe it. In front of everyone, including many who had been present that day, Illyria Windrunner thanked her sister for breaking the rules, for spoiling her test. But perhaps in the dawning of this new era, Sylvanas could see that moment in a different light. That moment had set Illyria on a different path, one that she had always destined, she was always destined to walk. Does anyone else request a formal vote? Illyria demanded. If so, let me cast the first yea in favor of my sister. Not a single hand was raised. Sylvanas noted with satisfaction that many of the forest riders who had sided with Helios looked embarrassed. She squared her soldier shoulders and turned to Lorthamar. I am ready. It was custom that after a ranger, gen ranger general was sworn in, they would symbolically take care of the forest riders by preparing a simple meal of small items, cubed cheese, cut fruit, slices of bread, and offering the, way, the tray to every member they would lead into battle one day. Theresa, thoughtful as always, had prepared the meal for her sister, but the tone in the room was hardly one of camaraderie after Helios's divisive suggestion and Illyria's abrupt arrival. And as always, the other two members of the trio stepped in smoothly to offer to distribute the food, while the three sisters took the rare chance to speak with each other as they walked to where the dragon hawks were tethered. I would have been there had I known, Illyria said. I am so sorry I didn't. Are you both all right? Sylvanas gave a bitter chuckle. Of course we are. We are wind runners. We have to be. Theresa said, It's good to see you, Illyria, if only for a few moments. Are you sure you cannot stay longer? I have to report to the king and then return immediately to Lordaeron, but I will make time to visit the artist's quarters and see our brother. Hopefully his majesty will listen to what I have to tell him. I am not at all sure he will, Sylvanas said. She stopped and they did as well, both looking at her curiously. And Asterion had instructed her to tell no one, but these were her sisters, one of whom had almost become Ranger General. Sylvanas trusted them with her life and her secrets. In a quiet voice, she informed them of the investigation, her conclusion, and Asterion's rejection of it. He believes he is helping our people by not causing fear when nothing is yet certain. Trolls, we understand. The Horde, we do not. Yet, Illyria said, this news disappoints me. I thought better of him. Still, I must try. You didn't tell me, Sylvanas, Verisa said quietly. I have not had a moment alone with you since learning of it, Sylvanas said a touch sharply. Lothamar and the others were at the site. 
They knew even without evidence that it was the Horde. Only Nathanos was with me when I found proof. I promised the king that I remain loyal to him. But I am also loyal to you, my sisters, and would have you at least know the truth. Illyria looked somber. We feared the worst when we heard the news. Your friends have few allies here in Quel'Thalas, Illyria. I hope that one day soon you will have more. But what about Lirath? Verisa asked. Will you tell him too? Sylvanas glanced down. One day, yes, but not now. I fear it will only damage him further or make him take up arms and try to kill the whole horde by himself. Illyria looked at her searchingly. Are you sure? She said. They were his parents, not just ours. He deserves to know. And if he wants to fight, why not train him? You asked me with me. You asked me to stay with him after the funeral, Verisa said. He misses them just as we do. But we have one another in the Far Striders. We have a chance to strike back. He doesn't. Silvana smiled a little. Brave words from one who has yet to make her first kill. Verisa reddened. Lirath wants to belong, she said. He wants to believe he still has a family. Illyria, you are gone now. You walk another path. Sylvanas and I see each other all the time. He is alone in Silvermoon. A pang of guilt struck Sylvanas. He will be glad to see you, Illyria, and I will visit him as well. We both will, Verisa. But do not tell him about mother and father. I still think you should train him, Illyria said. He is smart and dexterous. He will learn quickly now that he is a bit older. They did not know Lirath like she did. They did not know just how fully he had filled her heart the day he was born. They had not heard her whispered promise. Tell him a terrible new threat to Azeroth had ambushed and butchered their parents, put a sword into a hand that had only known fifes and harps? The thought of her sister's pain upon seeing her murdered parents stiffening on the earth made her sad. The thought of Lirath seeing them. Intolerable. No, she said flatly. He has suffered enough. Illyria sighed. He is an adult, old enough to make his own choices. But train him or not, as you will. In the meantime, I will not tell him about the attack. It should come from you, Sylvanas. Consider it, and think on training him too. I will, she said to keep the peace, to not bring tension between them now when the world was turning upside down. She had already given the idea all the attention it was due. Lirath would never need to defend himself. That was her task. They embraced then, the three of them. Sylvanas thought back to the days when they would dance barefoot in the sunlight, while their parents made them feel safe, and Lirath's songs made them feel that the world was full of grace and magic and mystery. Then Illyria swung herself atop her dragonhawk and was gone, heading toward a city that denied even what was in front of them, to a king who thought ignorance was protection. You want to do what? Lorthmar seldom raised his voice. Even rarer was the note of utter bafflement in his tone. I intend to offer Nathanos a position in the Farstriders, Sylvanas' voice was calm. You, Haldoran laughed, slightly nervous. You cannot possibly be serious. Oh, I am. Deadly. But he is human, Lorthamar said, still lost in the perceived illogic of it all. There is nothing in the code of the organization that says one must be Quel'Darai to be a Farstrider. He is as good a shot and tracker as either of you, and that is saying a great deal. He also brings an entirely different range of information, skill, and experience that can only serve us. Which, she added, you have both just witnessed. An Asterian may not wish to frighten the populace, but that does not mean we cannot learn more about these orcs who... She stopped herself and took a deep breath, releasing the hand she had unknowingly clenched tight, who struck at the heart of the things we hold dear, at civilized diplomacy and just defense and protection of the populace. Fine, then let us... Let him teach us what he knows, or better yet, go back to Lordaeron and send someone else in his place, Lorthamar said, finally seeming to shake himself out of his shock. He is a braggart and a bully, and he has remained among us far too long already. He saved your life, Sylvanas corrected, and you would repay him by sneering. I have expressed my gratitude, Lorthamar replied, many times, but truly saving a life should not warrant such exceptional treatment. Looking out for one's comrade should not be considered remarkable behavior. Sylvanas, Alderaan said in a more placating tone than Lorthamar had used, no matter what title or position you squander on him, Nathanos will never be accepted, not because he is a human, but because he is this particular one. 
You do not stand on the most stable ground as it is, as has recently been brought home to you. There are others than Helios who would smile to see you fail. They will not be smiling if I do fail. I am the one who stands between them and death. We, Sylvanas, we stand between them, said Helderon. He was growing angry. It was a rare sight, and Sylvanas had never before seen its heat directed at her. The far striders have ha had enough strife. Please do not bring anything unnecessary. Anything unnecessary. The rage Sylvanas had attempted to redirect now threatened to boil over. Nathanos is not a thing, Helderon, and he is very necessary to us right now. To me. He is necessary to me. I will not relinquish him to the Alliance. Helderon and Lorthamar were not there on the cold grey dawning of that first day without... Neither the king nor the prince will support this, Lorthamar cautioned. You have had a history of butting heads with them. They will forbid it. Kaelthus spends more time with humans than he does with his own people. I imagine he will think differently. In truth, she did not, but she was not about to let her friends know that. She would deal with the Sunstriders later, somehow. People will talk, Lord Lamar said, choosing his words with the same deliberateness her father had displayed on so many occasions. Sylvanas was done. Let them, she said. I will still do this. We need every weapon we can find. She would do everything in her power so that no other family had to grieve as hers had. And she needed Nathanos, ugly, blunt, sarcastic Nathanos, who somehow understood her better than anyone, even Lirath. The human knew much of pain and anger and cruelty, things she was becoming more acquainted with by the hour. Nathanos stays and he will be a fast rider, and that, Sylvanas snapped, forestalling any more argument, is an order. I didn't ask you to make me a fast rider, Nathanos said when she told him the news a few days later. They were walking hand in hand around Lake Elrendar, their footsteps so light from practice they barely disturbed the local fauna. I know. I wanted to make you a fast rider. Maybe even a ranger lord. What? Why? You're very good. We need you, Sylvanas said. Not buying that. It's as you wish, she said. I think, Nathanus mused, that you somehow thought I'd leave you if you didn't. That belief insults both my superior intelligence and my excellent vision. Sylvanas smiled at that, relieved at the certainty of knowing that he was willing to become a forest rider, that someone she cared for at least wouldn't abandon her through death or disinterest. The latter he had always made clear, and the former... Denied as they might, but Nathanos was the equal of Halderon and Lorthamar. He would not fall in battle. Since the attack, Sylvanas had found reasons to avoid anything that reminded her too intensely of the life they had all lived before. She had assigned Verisa duties that kept them separate, and despite her words to Illyria during her older sister's unexpected and timely visit, she was not ready to reach out to Lirath. She could not risk collapsing under the weight of his pain. Both of them would fall then. Sylvanas took comfort in knowing he had friends who cared about him at court, among them the prince himself, and Verisa was spending more of her free time with him as well. For now, that would be enough. The wind shifted, bearing the subtle trace of an unwelcome scent. Smoke. Nathanos smelled it too. Fire, he said, and even as he spoke, they both heard the long, low sound of a warning horn. By this point, Sylvanas was sprinting back to the enclave. He followed, and she saw that several forest riders were already borne aloft by dragonhawks heading the same direction. Her mind was racing. While the sun well protected Quel'Thalas and bathed it in magic, it could not prevent every mishap. Campfires sometimes burn out of control. The odd lightning strike made a lethal torch out of a simple tree. But Sylvanas knew in her heart this fire was not caused by one of those rare events. It came too close on the heels of her sister's warning. She saw as she fled south that it was not one fire, but four, all to the south of the river Elrendar. Plumes of thick black smoke curled upward. These fires had been deliberately set. Sylvanas was not a stranger to battle. She and Illyria had both followed their mother's orders in the occasional skirmish with the old enemy. Now it was Sylvanas who needed to lead, so very much earlier than anyone had ever expected. Part of her quailed from the responsibility. The rest of her faced it squarely. I may be your second choice, mother, but you will see that I am not second best. Such a prideful statement. Not a conversation seems so long ago, but now it was time to prove the words true. If not to her mother, who has passed hearing them, then to herself. We are under attack, Sylvanas called, bringing the dragonhawk down. Four fires, one due south, two southwest, one northeast near Suncrown Village. Evacuating citizens is the top priority. I'll wager that you'll find not just the fires, but those who set it lurking in the edges of the forest. 
so do some clean-up of that mess as well. Alderon, Lothamar, tackle the two to the west. Take the spear unit. Helios, head south. Keep your eyes open. I do not think the trolls are acting alone. You think it's the Horde? Helios asked. Sylvanas noticed that he and her friends as well all glanced over at Nathanos. He was a faint comfort in a dark time to see that even if it was, they would not accept him, they would still listen to him. She, But she was their ranger general, and so she was the one to respond. It is too bold for a typical troll attack, Sylvanas said. Nathanos, go with Helios. Hurry. He nodded once curtly, and he, Helios, Haldron, and Lorthamar hastened off. Sylvanas Windrunner watched them go for just a heartbeat, then steeled herself to face the monsters who had slain her parents. The moment she dreaded and yearned for was not long in arriving. She had taken her own advice and led a group of rangers not toward the fires but away from them. The horde had set them to draw the elves, knowing they would come to protect their forests, but the green things and their troll allies did not give the Quelderai the credit they were due, and she would see to it that this would cost them. She heard them before anyone else and made a quick gesture. The forest riders leaped into the trees so deftly the leaves barely quivered and the orcs approached. They were loud and laughing, and she could not help but imagine them coming for her parents. Mother could not even stand against them. What chance do I have? I have no battle of seven arrows to give me strength. But hard on the heels of that debilitating thought was another. I have her training, her blood, and by the sun well, her will. She gave a signal that passed swiftly through those gathered, silent, shielded by golden leaves. Pick your target. Sylvanas found hers at once. It was the biggest, the ugliest, the one that strode with confidence and pride in destroying beauty with fire and hope with slaughter. She imagined it was this one, short yellow tusks, tiny cruel eyes whose arrow had killed her mother. She took aim, then shot the arrow neatly into one of those cruel eyes. Sylvanas found a second orc who had, like the others, abruptly shifted into a defensive posture, a sword as big as she in each oversized fist. This one is for my father. A few moments and an eternity later, every member of the Horde unit was dead or dying. Two of her own had been casualties. One far shredder had lost her grip and toppled to the earth. She fell to an axe blade. But Sylvanas saw to it that her body was covered with that of her killer, his thick green skin peppered with arrows. The other was wounded but would survive. Despite his protest, Sylvanas ordered him removed from the battle. The next several hours were filled with blood and flame as more fires sprang up. Of course, the Horde would not be content with battle. This menace would destroy whatever it touched. Anything of beauty needed to be violated. It had not been so very long since she had said to Nathanos, Those we protect, we protect them not just from the danger. We protect them from the true face of this world. Well, the true face of another world had shown itself in the worst way possible, right at her very doorstep. And that face was more hideous than any nightmare with an even darker heart. Sylvanas pushed her ever southward, doing what she could to drive the horde back through the gates, out of her glorious homeland. The Farstriders and other units were doing the same at her command, and though the air was thick and dark and hard to breathe, no one faltered. If the orcs got past them, they knew it was at stake. Sylvanas thought of the small villages filled with friends and relatives, of her family's own home still being tended by those who had wept bitterly when learning the fates of Larissa and Virath, and she thought of the old song that Lirath often sang, his sweet voice devastating in its heartbreak, the lament for lives lost thousands of years ago. Had he written one for their parents? She did not know. Sylvanas resolved that when this war was over and the Quelderai were once again victorious, she would seek her brother out and embrace him. Elves were capable of living for centuries. That did not mean they would, and this dark day was brutal proof. Sylvanas' emphasis on evacuating the civilians saved lives, and for that she was glad, but so many graceful buildings were lost, as well as huge swaths of the forest south of the river. Fortunately for Golden Mist Village, there was a natural firebreak in the form of the Elrendar, which also proved to be a challenge for the trolls and orcs who would cross it. Sylvanas ordered her unit to stand on the river's banks, spread along as much of its length as possible, and pick off any horde foolish enough to attempt a crossing. There was a ray of hope in that it seemed likely they could save the northern half of their land, but the southern part of the forest would take years to recover, and that broke Sylvanas's heart. There was motion on the other side, and Sylvanas was instantly alert. Two elven figures were running as fast as they could to the river. Behind them, the golden leaves of the tree shook as monsters concealed in the branches leaped from bough to bough, em emitting horrible, cackling laughter. Sylvanas blinked. She knew the runners. They were Verisa and Illyria. Unwilling to see their prey escape into the water, the trolls moved down to the ground. 
Sylvanas dropped her clenched fist, and at her, the signal, her entire unit began to fire. She joined them, taking satisfaction in seeing the large, ugly bodies at last lying still. Sylvanas held up her bow in greeting. Welcome home, Illyria, she called. Now what is this trouble you've brought us? I did not bring it, Sylvanas, Illyria called back. I had hoped to outrun it, but I do bring possible salvation. I must speak to the council. Sylvanas shook her head and repeated the warning she had given her sister the last time she had arrived unexpectedly in the forests of their homeland. I do not know if they will listen. They will listen, Illyria said, and Sylvanas heard the banked anger of the righteous in her voice. I will give them no choice. I have something to show them. She lifted a sack that contained something round and heavy. The bottom of the sack was soaked with blood. Sylvanas knew what it must be. Orc, she said hopefully. Troll, Illyria replied, but that will be enough. And I did not come alone. Alliance troops commanded by a paladin named Turalyon followed the horde here and are eager to catch them. Paladin? Nathanos had said something about them. They were warrior priests who used both the powers of the light and a solid hammer or sword. Sylvanas approved of the combination. Where are they now? In the southwest, Illyria replied. My unit will join them, Sylvanas replied. We will get you a dragon hawk. Good luck. You will need it. Lorthamar and Haldoran were already at the meeting site with their units, and to Sylvanas' surprise, so were the warriors Illyria had requested from Anisterion. Sylvanas felt a sharp, angry pang. It wasn't so long ago that Anisterion had looked her in the eye and promised that this very battle could never happen, that the Horde would never dare threaten the borders of Quel'Thalas, that the justice her parents deserved was worth less than the price of peace. In the time since, she had, despite his initial refu refusal, asked his council for supplemental aid for more patrols and received nothing from the court but a faint warning that further protests would not be acceptable. Illyria, who had left them all behind, had returned now, and the old king lent her his ear and his troops. But Sylvanas quickly banished the thought. By now, the populace had been disabused of any notion that their kingdom was safe, and if Anisterion had been with his council when Illyria met him, it would have been folly to refuse the fight, to fight the enemy on their doorstep. The ranger general took a quick assessment of the battlefield and began to fire. The young paladin, Sir Turalyon, proved to know his strategy. In short order, they developed a rhythm, the archers raining arrows on tight clusters of orcs, the spear units coming right after them to finish the job and defend the alliance soldiers in their midst as they hacked away with their swords. It was carnage and it was deserved, and Sylvanas rejoiced. Shadows fell, then vanished, and Sylvanas looked up. Silhouetted against the sky were griffins ridden by dwarves. One of them swooped low as the dwarf hurled his hammer. It connected with an orc skull in a most satisfactory manner, then returned to its thrower. It appeared the tide was turning. Then to Sylvanas' shock, she saw that Illyria had raised her bow into the air, holding it in the position that meant retreat. For a moment, Sylvanas was confused, but then another shadow fell over those fighting at the edge of the forest. Sylvanas looked up and gasped. It was silhouetted against the sun for a long moment, a gigantic shape with mighty wings like those of a bat and a long neck and tail. She had seen this creature before, but only in paintings, or occasionally gracing the pages of an otherwise ordinary tome. As it soared, the sunlight glinted on a body covered in red scales. It was beautiful and utterly terrifying, and Sylvanas simply stood, struck to her core. A red dragon. Then the beast broke the spell, shook its head, then arched its long, sinuous neck. Sylvanas realized what was about to happen. Had happened. Fall back! Fall back! she cried. There was a mad scramble as the Alliance ran full tilt to escape immolation from above. The dragon wheeled, returning for more passes. The sky filled with smoke and the trees were gone. Simply gone. Not burned, but turned to ash. No wonder the fires had done so much damage. No wonder they seemed to spring up from nowhere. During one pass from the great creature, Sylvanas could make out a tiny shape perched atop the beast's back. The mighty dragon breathing fire hot enough to turn metal to liquid, a being so powerful that it inspired awe at even the mere mention of its name, seemed to be obeying the commands of a single simple orc. I do not know what to name these things that crawled from the portal, Sylvanus thought bleakly. Monsters too kind a word. Sylvanus shook off the daze, the shock of seeing two impossible things in as many minutes. She ran toward the gathering of warriors, paladins, and forest riders seeking out Illyria and Turalyon. Sylvanas searched the crowd until she spotted the paladin on his horse. Her sisters and Lorthamar fell into step with her as she approached them. They are already retreating, said Turalyon. They know they cannot breach Silvermoon, so they have done what they came to do. Demoralize and so fear. 
but they had done something else too. They had ignited in all three of the Windrunner sisters a hatred hot as any dragon flame. If Quel'Thalas is not so safe from incursion, what is? asked the Ranger General of Silvermoon. No one had an ang answer. It took every ounce of restraint from Sylvanas to allow the Horde to retreat, but there was nothing they could do. Their numbers were too diminished and the forces that remained were needed to assess the damage and control the fires threatening the villages and woods. Turalyon suspected the Horde was finally ready to march on Lordaeron's capital city. There was no rest for the weary, and Sylvanas watched as Alliance soldiers stayed still only for bandaging then began to move back toward the road that led from Quel'Thalas to the East Weald. You go ahead, Illyria said to Turalyon. I'll catch up. Of course, the paladin inclined his golden head toward Sylvanas. The Alliance and I are very grateful for your aid this day. Oh, man. Oh. Sylvanas watched him go, noting the look he threw Illyria and the hint of a smile on her face. She was concerned for her sister's heart, but had no grounds to condemn her. After all, she too was involved with a human, one far less popular than Turalyon. I suppose this means you cannot stay, Verisa said. Illyria shook her head regretfully. It seems whenever my path leads me here, it leads me away just as quickly. Our family has experienced the cruelty of the Horde, but we must not allow others to suffer that fate, if at all possible. There is no time to linger if Lord Ron is to have any warning at all. So we've covered all this material in other books, so this is just... I think this is why she's kind of brushing through the entire war, um, because Sylvanas, we, she's already written about it in other books, and this is just important parts of Sylvanas' perspective. Sylvanas understood. She was the only one of them who had seen Larissa and Virath where they had fallen. Her younger siblings had only seen the corpses after they had been cleaned, their limbs arranged peacefully, the sight of the grievous wounds concealed by formal robes, and perhaps a touch of illusion magic to soften the blow further. No, she would not wish what she had endured on anyone. We must follow the horde before they elude us again and have a chance to regroup, Illyria said. Go swiftly then, sister, Sylvanas said, and the two embraced. Verisa next hug her, hugged her eldest sister tightly, unwilling to let go, and Illyria had to gently disengage herself. She nodded as if to confirm something, then smiled slightly before turning to retreat with the young paladin. Sylvanas knew that this was the first time Verisa had seen bloodshed in battle, her little sister should not be dwelling on it. There was time for her to work through her feelings later. Right now, Verisa needed to feel useful, that she had purpose. Find some of your fellows, Sylvana said. Send them off in small groups to help extinguish fires in the places that need aid. The youngest sister nodded as Sylvana had expected, grateful to have helpful work to ward off brooding on what had transpired. I will, I will make a sweep along the shoreline. Verisa, the younger woman turned. You did well today. Mother would have been proud of you. I am. Verisa smiled that sweet smile of hers. She would have been proud of all of us. I wish she could have seen us fight together. The Windrunner sisters are a force to be reckoned with, Sylvanas agreed. It was a pity the eldest had given her bow to the Alliance, and perhaps her heart to the young paladin. Sylvanas was tired, but also still alert, still tense from the battle. None of the sisters had mentioned it, but it was highly likely that both Windrunner Village and the Spire had come under attack from trolls or orcs or red dragon fire. Larissa had drilled the household on evacuation practices, so Sylvanas was hopeful she would find it at least empty, if not intact, but she was deeply concerned about the village. The final conflict had been enacted closer to her family home than she would have liked, so the walk was not far. It was hard to see in the still smoky air. Ash lay thick on the earth, muffling sound like snow. Sylvanas slowed as she approached, expecting to be challenged by the scouts positioned farthest from the village. She scanned the woods, but her sharp eyes saw and heard nothing. Sylvanas brought the horn to her lips and blew a long, mournful note. The echoes died. No one responded. Perhaps they had already heard the good news and were busy helping quell the fires that still raged throughout their land. But something was not right. The feeling prickled at the back of her neck, and she again went into high alert. Her eye was drawn by the strange, odd lumps marring the green sweep of the hills. Sun glinted off metal and she saw glimpses of a green that was not the good natural hue of grass and growing things. Orcs. A sudden fear buffeted her with the force of a massive wave and for no good reason she could determine, Sylvanas began to run as fast as her legs could bear her, her heart racing, trying to deny the awful terror that hammered in her brain. 
10, 20 more of them were revealed to her with each step she ran, flying over the grass so swiftly she barely felt her feet touch the earth. And then as Sylvanas had hoped she would not, she saw other bodies, slim figures, one clad in far strider armor, Jadia. Other corpses wore bits and pieces of armor, doubtless grabbed at the last moment in a valiant but doomed effort to ward off the invaders. Closer she came to the village that her family had protected for so many centuries, and now she was seeing brightly colored clothing. Civilians, patrons of the arts, or politicians climbing the ladder to power. They would hear no more music, paint no more art, decide no one's fate, not even their own. Movement caught her eye and she whirled. A woman in a long wine-red dress. Please let that be some survivors. She sprinted, hope flooding her and giving her speed, but as Sylvanas dropped to her knees beside the woman, the ranger general realized at once she had been mistaken. The movement had been nothing but wind and long unbound hair. The dark red fabric, silk that had once rustled as its owner danced and drank and laughed the night away, had merely hidden the more crimson stain of far too much of her lifeblood. Sylvanas rocked back on her heels, looking around in dazed, grieving horror. It would seem she had not needed the lesson her parents had lost their lives for her to learn. The horde was more intelligent and better prepared than anyone had expected. How many signs of their presence had she missed? Enough to understand how horribly well they had scouted the landscape? It was the only way she could fathom how enough of the monsters had slipped past their watch. Sylvanas got to her feet and began to search for survivors among the carnage, and in that grim task discovered many she had known. Bellaria Salinar, who had come with her sister to say an effusive goodbye to Illyria, Aravan and Rendris, the youths whose cups she had sprinkled woundwood at a party that seemed so long ago now. One limp form sprawled face had been tall and lean in life with long gold hair that... Irath? Sylvanas exhaled in relief, shaking at the sudden spurt as of adrenaline faded. Of course it was not him. The male figure was clad in archer's leathers, not the long colorful robes of a royal musician. An orcish throwing axe, short and ugly, was embedded in his back. The blood glistened in the sunlight, still wet. The elf had lived for some time until the wound had finally claimed his life. The hue of his hair, gold as a newly minted coin. Her legs quivered as she walked unsteadily over to the body. Kneeling beside it, Sylvanas paused. She did not lack courage, she knew, or will. Some said she was recklessly brave, but she did not feel brave now. She felt small and afraid and lost. Sylvanas simply could not bring herself to look at him. She thought of pulling the coverings off the bodies of her mother, then her father. She had thought her heart would never hurt more than it did at those moments. How pathetically wrong she had been, and how fate must have laughed knowing what it held in store for her. Gently, Sylvanas touched him with the same care she had shown him in the first hour of his life, easing him onto his back, dreading what death might have done to him already. Lirath's face was relaxed in death, but the shredded hands and the blood trail behind him told the story of how he had tried to crawl to safety as his life ebbed. Sylvanas reached to touch that still face, brushing away the dirt and grass. She gathered him so still, so cold into her arms, cradling his golden head on her lap, one arm around him, holding him as she had when he was a baby, when his blue eyes had fixed on hers and she had made a deep vow. I will never hurt you, ever. No one else will, either. With love and courage, I will keep you safe. Sylvanas had broken that vow twice. She had been the one to wound him with words, even before this terrible day. She had failed not only her promise, not only her brother, but also the people of Windrunner Village. Her first true battle, and she had let it take away the brightest beacon of hope and peace she had ever known. And because she had so failed, there would be no chance for reconciliation. No warm laugh or embrace. Lirath was forever silent, forever still. Sylvanas reached for one of the damaged hands, still pliable enough for her to entwine hers with his. She looked at the torn nails, the dirt, the blood, and saw only slim fingers flying across the holes of a flute or pressed against the strings of a lute. She closed her eyes and heard in the breeze the sweetest voice she would ever hear. My little lord, son. Sylvanas had striven so hard to keep the world's harshness away from him, and in that striving had only driven him toward it. She would have gladly given her life to save his, and yet Sylvanas had not even had the grace to admit she was wrong. It was not true. 
It could not be. Lirath was so vibrant, so quick, so alive. Surely, somehow, this was a trick, a prank, like the one he had played on her when she thought him drowned. But the world went on, and he remained still and silent. Sylvanas could not weep. She could not move, not just yet. So she sat in the bright afternoon sunshine, gently rocking in her arms, the one she had loved best in the world, and did the only thing she could for him. She took a deep, shaky breath. By the light, by the light of the sun, children of the blood, our enemies are breaking through. Children of the blood, by the light, failing children of the blood, they're breaking through. So she sings for him. And we have one chapter left in this part. So yeah, I think... We've already seen in other books how that breaks Illyria. And it takes her a long time to really become normalized again. And Sylvanas cared for him the most, so I think this is going to break her even more and set her on a precipice um, and, and really inform who she becomes. All right, we knew it was coming and it is a bummer, but we got another episode in the pipe 5x5 five five and we will wrap up the second part on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft.